few weeks. And now I'd like to welcome everybody to Wednesday Night Lab and the little formal part here. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the Biotechnology Center on campus. I will also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night by Zoom 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Maria Mora Pinzone. She is a physician here at UW-Madison with the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. She's also a physician researcher with the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. And Maria, if you can say hello. Oh, you're already up there. That's doing good. I'm about to ask you the five questions, which you are going to probably answer in your uh, PowerPoint, but... Here we go. Maria, where were you born? Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm super, super happy, and I hope we can have great conversation at the end. And I believe that one picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and then just to start, where I was born, I was born and raised in Puerto Ordaz in Venezuela. And that's almost 3,000 miles for, from here. That's where the accent comes from. So my native language is Spanish. And my town is famous for its rivers. We have an abundance of water and many a couple rivers that help us generate electricity. And that's what makes my hometown of Puerto Ordaz famous of all the electricity that we generate for the country. And where did you go to high school? My high school is Colegio Nazaret, also in Puerto Ordaz. And this is a picture of how it looked like a bunch of years ago uh, when I was there. And then where'd you go for your undergraduate and your medical degrees? Um, my undergraduate is the same medical degree. In Venezuela, we don't do undergrad and then medical school is six years of medical school. So I started medical school when I was 17 at the Univers Central University of Venezuela. And I'm sharing some pictures with you because the university is the oldest in the country. It started in the 1800s. But through the years, it was designed to be a living museum. And you can see that when we walk through the university, there's multiple statues and architecture that makes a university a place for learning and a place for art. So this is the Universidad Central de Venezuela, which is in Caracas. Pretty impressive, a campus that is also a museum. I kind of like it. And then you came to the United States to pursue a degree at Rush University? Correct. So I did a master's degree in clinical research at Rush University, that's in Chicago. And then after that, I came to Madison for preventive medicine residency. And that was in 2015. And after I finished my residency on 2017, I decided to stay because this is a great place to be. Excellent. And then uh, if you want to put your title slide on, that would be great. Tonight, you're going to talk with us about barriers to diagnosing Alzheimer's disease among Latinx individuals more than a language issue. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to uh, welcome Maria Mora up in the zone to Wednesday night at the lab. And Maria, please take it away anytime. Thank you so much. So as you mentioned before, I'm a preventive medicine physician. And I would like to start with that because many of you might never heard of that a preventive medicine physician is even a thing. Uh, some of you might, hear, might think physicians, pediatricians, surgeons, uh, family medicine, internal medicine. Preventive medicine is another specialty on its own. We take care of the populations and for that we use different tools, including epidemiology, quality improvement, research, public health strategies. Our goal is to take care of the health of the public populations and the communities and making sure everybody has access to health and healthcare, whatever they are. So the topic of this talk is Alzheimer's disease. And you might sometimes hear me say Alzheimer's disease and related dementias or dementia. So I would like to start with a little definition here, just to make sure that um, 
no, there's no question. Some people might ask me, are they the same thing? Eh, not necessarily, but sort of. Let's start with that. So dementia usually refers to a cluster of symptoms. Most commonly when we refer to dementia, it might be due to many causes. It could be due to Alzheimer's disease. It could be due to Parkinson's. It could be due to a stroke. But the symptoms that people experience are memory changes, difficulty remembering tasks, difficulty in doing things um, in their daily life. These symptoms affect their ability to interact with others and to take care of themselves. That's dementia. Alzheimer's disease is one type of dementia. So in, and this one affects the brain and sometimes it might be present with other diseases. But let's talk about the symptoms before we go too much deeper. These are the most common symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Memory loss, disorientation, when you get to a place like, where, wait, where, where do I was going? Uh, I got lost in the, the street. Change in mood of behavior. And I think I like always to tell my patients, it's like, no, your mom or your dad is not stubborn. They are going through some things. Their brain is changing. They have difficulty performing tasks, things like, oh, I was doing a cake and I did a cake every week of my, during my whole life and now I forgot the ingredients. Things that were before second nature, now they start to be, become more difficult. Poor to decrease judgment. When things happen and the person doesn't react as we expect. An example, there's a fire and they don't call 911 or they don't call for help. They start misplacing things. Like where do I leave my glasses? That might be normal. Where do I leave my glasses every day and to the point that I have had to change glasses several times, that's different. And difficulty finding the right words might be another symptom. All of these things together are some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's. And I want to be clear that when they start to happen so frequently that affect our ability to do or regular activities, and so we need to get worried. So what do Latinos think about Alzheimer's disease? And I've been asking this question to many of the Latinos because um, there's many misconceptions across races and ethnicities. But the first step to clarify something is to making sure to we understand when we're, what do people think? For many of the Latinos that I have asked, Alzheimer's is a loss of oneself. They use many words for referring to sadness, so this is a paraphrasing of a quote uh, that I was told. When Alzheimer's is there, everything is lost. People cannot sustain themselves. They cannot eat, they cannot talk, and they, they cannot interact with their family members. And this is particularly worrisome because Alzheimer's disease affects everybody. But Latinos, Hispanics, are affected more frequently than non-Hispanic whites. And our African-American counterparts are also more frequently affected. To give you an idea, if right now we have 100 people, 100 Latinos that are older than 65, 12 of them might have Alzheimer's disease. If we have a group of 100, Latin, uh, 100 African-Americans over 65, 14 of them might have Alzheimer's disease. And if we have a group of 100 um, older adults, a white older adults, only 10 of them might have Alzheimer's disease. But we are expecting that this number is just going to go up. And by 2060, that number is going to be three times more. And this is happening right now. And this is one of the things why my research, I do this research. We need to prepare now for the number of people that we're going to have and take care of in the future. And before going too much farther, you have heard me say Hispanic, you have heard me say Latino, and you probably heard, I've seen in the news different words to refer to us. So let's just start with clarifying what do I mean? Who is Hispanic or Latino? Hispanic is an ethnic origin, and it can be referred to as the heritage, nationality, or lineage, country of birth of somebody or their parents. It's not a race. Latinos, we come in all races and we might be black, we can be white, we can be native. And that's, that's why sometimes you see non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, because Latinos come in different races. But who is Hispanic and who is Latino? 
Sometimes you might see these words and think that they are the same and they're slightly different. Hispanic is somebody that speaks Spanish or whose primary language is Spanish or whose family or heritage comes from a Spanish speaking country. When we refer to Latinos, we are referring to those that are coming from Latin America. And even though sometimes Hispanics can be also Latinos, that's not always the case. So we see here in the center, people from Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Puerto Rico, Uruguay, and Venezuela, we are considered both Hispanic and Latino because we are from Latin America, but also our primary language is Spanish. People that's from Spain, they are only Hispanic. And people that's from Latin America that speaks other languages are Latino. For example, Brazil, they speak Portuguese. Haiti, they speak French Creole. Uh, Martinique, San Martin, these are countries that we consider Latino, but they are not Hispanic because they speak languages different than Spanish. So now this is where it gets complicated. What words should I use? Well, it depends. It depends on who you're asking and who, what, who's your audience. Most of us will use the word, the country of origin or heritage to describe ourselves. So if you're asking, where are you from? I say, I'm from Venezuela, but my culture is from Colombia. Some people might, if you ask, what do you prefer, Hispanic or Latino? Most of us have no preference. Some prefer Hispanic, some prefer Latino. And this is a generational shift. Hispanic has been a word that we have been using since the 70s. So mostly of our older adults, they tend to use the word Hispanic. Latino, we started using the word Latino to describe ourselves since the 90s. So there's still a relatively new term. And this is where it gets, uh, sometimes we might use the word for to mean one or the other. It depends on what we are asking. If we are asking only people that speak Spanish, maybe we're referring to Hispanic. If we are uh, referring to people from Latin America, we are rather to use the word Latino. But if you ask somebody, they might say, I'm from Cuba, I'm from Puerto Rico, because that's the most important identity that they have. And you might have seen some of these words in the news recently, the word Latinx. So Latino is a male gender word. Latina is a female word. So in over the last few years, the word Latinx was created by queer Latinx activists who are looking for a gender neutral word to identify themselves. It's still very new. It's been, it hasn't been around more than 30 years. So it's common that you might see some headlines about this, but this is a generational shift. Most of my younger students might use the word Latinx to describe themselves. And if I try to refer to gender neutral to like you all, I might use Latinx. Well, now let's go now deeper to who are those Hispanic Americans, Latino Americans. Um, according to the census, and we got very new information just last week, 19% of the US population is Latino. And I want to be, give you a little trick. Many times we might think the Latinos are foreigners, but 65% of those of the Latinos living in the US are native US citizens. They were born here or from US citizen parents. And this includes Puerto Rico. 65% of the Latinos in the US are US citizens. 13% of them are naturalized citizens and 22% are non, not citizens. So this includes people with green cards, asylum seekers, visa holders, students, workers. There's a, la a large group that is in that percentage. Now going a little bit to the Latinos in Wisconsin. When I say, hey, no, I'm coming from Wisconsin, the people say, what, are there Latinos in Wisconsin? And I say, yes, <laughs> we are 7%, but we are here. And this number has going up over the years. This graph coming from the UW extension shows how the population has been spreading through Wisconsin over the last 20 years. 
Uh, we see that the colors, the blue, indicates more density of population. And since 1990, we started in the southern part of the state and has been, the number of Latinos across the state has been growing up. But now, let's go back to the point of Alzheimer's disease before going too far. The Latino older adults that are above 65 years old are only 2% of the older adults in Wisconsin. That's not a huge number, but they are the fastest growing group in this category. So in the last 20 years, the Hispanic older adults have increased almost 300%. And I'm using the word Hispanic here because that's what the data the census tracks. Sometimes I use the word that was used for the definition because I don't want to complicate things and say, are these really Latino? Are these really Hispanic? Then, but this is what the, you, the Wisconsin data tell us. And then why is this important? Why is it important that Latinos are just growing up? The number of Latinos, older adults is going up. By 2060, across the United States, the number of Latinos with Alzheimer's disease is just going to go up by 900%. 900%. That's less, less than 40 years from now. We are most likely to have Alzheimer's disease and also our numbers are going up. We need to prepare our community. We need to prepare our health systems to be able to take care of the Latinos that are going to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's over the next few years. So why Latinos have higher risk of Alzheimer's? It's not genetics. Let's just start with that. It's not genetics. Again, Latino refers to ethnicity. We know the things that makes us more likely to have Alzheimer's. This is coming from the Lancet, and it was an article published a year, a couple of years ago. The most common factors that affect Alzheimer's disease or risk of having Alzheimer's disease are education. The more education you have, the more protective factors you have. Hearing loss, um, if we don't use, if we are starting to lose our hearing and we don't use hearing aids, we stop connecting to the world and that increases, accelerates the development of Alzheimer's. Brain injuries, but also chronic conditions like high blood pressure, high blood sugar, um, depression, uh, alcohol, obesity, um, and also other things like smoking, other things like social isolation, which has been huge during COVID, and we know we are missing the social connection, the interaction. And this is one of the things that we don't know how it's going to affect us. Most, all of us, we have been at reduced our circles. So how this is going to affect the number of people with Alzheimer's disease or dementia over the next 20 years, we still don't know. But we know it's going to be an issue. And Latinos are more likely to have uncontrolled chronic conditions. They are more likely to have high blood pressure and high blood sugar. They are more likely to, have, to be obese. They are more likely to have, be physically inactive due to the conditions, the type of years that they have, the type of living in food deserts and other aspects. Other factor that affects Latinos is that we are less likely to have um, graduate degrees. If this is a statistics from 2017. When 40% of Americans had at least high school diploma. That number, it was actually 60% for Latino Hispanics in the United States. That means that we are losing a protective factor and that is not as common among of our community. But this risk and the distribution of these things is not the same. Latinos are not the same and it's not just one size fits all. We know that there's conflicted data depending on the origin. Studies from Mexican Americans that live in Sacramento tell us that the incidence of Alzheimer's disease might be just 1% per year. But the same study do, do, uh, done in New York with Caribbeans, that means people from Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and other Caribbean countries, their risk of having Alzheimer's disease is 2.5% per year. And these risks, we know that they are not the same, but we don't know why. Most of the research doesn't have enough Latinos to be able to see what the difference. What are the factors that are causing this type of differences between 
a Latino that lives in Florida and a Latino that lives in California. We don't know yet. And it's part of my research. How do we make sure that we understand these differences? And the risk is just one little aspect of all the things that are affecting diagnosis. When Latinos are diagnosed, uh, sorry, when Latinos with Alzheimer's disease are less likely to have a diagnosis, less likely to receive treatment, more likely to be, pay, ca pay, be care at home by unpaid caregivers. We take care of our own. That's a very common phrase that I, a phrase that I hear. We live longer, but also we develop symptoms earlier. The more I see these statistics, the more I see this, all of this is related to access. Access to a diagnosis, access to healthcare, access to prevention. And that's one of the things that I wanna define access as timely use of personal health services. And I'll give you an example. Just because right now we have the technology to go to the moon, doesn't mean that everybody can do it. Similarly, just because we have the tools to diagnose Alzheimer's disease does not mean that everybody can go and get a diagnosis. And what are the factors that affect diagnosis? I like to classify them as a person factors, organizational factors, and context. Person, do you have insurance? Do you go to the doctor and ask the doctor about your symptoms? Do you think that Alzheimer's is something that you should seek care for? The organization, okay, I have insurance. Is my insurance accepted where I go? Is the staff trained to take care of somebody like me? Um, or is the times of the office available uh, when I go, where I can go? But also there's a lot of contextual factors. One is the stigma. A lot of people do not want to talk about this. Um, they will not seek care. And if they feel that having a diagnosis will affect how somebody, everybody else treats them, they might avoid to go to the doctor. And this is particularly worrisome when according to the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Service, almost 40% of the Hispanics and Latinos that have had some memory problem over the last year, had one or more barriers to get care. These are commonly that they don't have insurance. They were worried about the cost. Uh, even when you have insurance, you know, the copay, the parking, to the going to the doctor, or oh, you have need to get a diagnosis or get a specific test, does the insurance cover that or no? Those things are worried, uh, worried uh, a worry for many people. Some of them couldn't get an appointment soon enough. Some of them needed to wait too long to see a doctor. And think about how many times have you been to a doctor and your appointment is at 9 a.m. and it's 10 in 10.30 and you still haven't been seen. Maybe you have somebody waiting for you. Maybe you need to go to work. All of these factors affect how we get care. Many of them said they didn't have transportation. And think about this affects everybody. How many of you have seen or live uh, somewhere that you need to drive 20, 30 minutes to get the care that you need? What about when you need to drive two hours because you need a specialist? What if the, uh, did you need to get a specific test that's not here? All of those things we know affect care. But then let's say that these things are not an issue. Let's say that, okay, we got the point. What else can be, we're ready, right? That's it, we're set. Uh, not so fast. So many Latinos, uh, we cannot get a diagnosis because the tests that we use are, have not been evaluated with Latinos. And let me give you an example. Let's say one of the tests, I asked you to pick, show me a picture of a house. And you put a, the ceiling, two windows, a little tree because that's my tree and the door. That looks very similar to the house where you live. So what will happen if I ask somebody that's not from here to set, to draw the house and they, instead of a tree, they put water under the house. You might think, okay, this person is confused. 
Well, what if they come from a place where that's the normal? Most of these tests work because we define what's normal. And we decide, so somebody should answer this way. When these tests have not been done, evaluated in Latinos, we don't know what's normal for Latinos. So it makes that sometimes the test as confusing or the results is like, eh, we're not sure if this is Alzheimer's or dementia or something else. Another part of this relates that the, the test is not available in the preferred language. And remember, we have many languages in Latin America. We have Portuguese, we have French Creole, and we have many ethnic uh, dialects. Uh, Quechua, for example, and other native languages. 72% of the Latinx, so the Latinos living in the United States are fluent in English. But of our current adults, the ones that are being diagnosed right now, only 43% of them feel proficient in English. Most of we have about 20% that they don't speak English at all. And those are the ones that are having a harder time getting a diagnosis. Also, think about People like me, we are fully bilingual. Well, if you show me a picture of a boat and I cannot remember the word in English, but I can tell you the word in Spanish, how do we count that? Many of the tests have not been developed thinking about that. I have two or more languages in my brain. And even if the test is in the language of preference, many times there are additional words that we don't know and physicians and providers and healthcare uh, personnel, we are very aware of this. And I'll give you another example because I love examples. So this is your calf muscle, the, the, the back of your leg. For this, uh, imagine that, okay, I'm going to ask my patient if they have had any pain in their calf muscle. So I go to Google and I say, what's the word for calf muscle? Oh, pantorrilla, okay. But if I say that word, the patient looks at me like, huh? That's the correct word. And that's the word in Spanish. But in some countries, that's known as chamorro. In other countries, they call it gemelos. And in my home country, we call it batata. But if you write batata on Google, it will tell you that's a sweet potato. So, Imagine at, in an appointment when you have all of these words flying around and even with an interpreter that they are go, okay, I don't know what the patient is referring. What's a batata? They think that now I'm talking about a sweet potato. They might think I'm confused when it's just that the words that I'm using are not the most common ones. Now, let's say you got an appointment. There's a staff to help you. The language is not an issue. We are set, right? No, of course you knew that I was coming this way. Even in this scenario, 44% of Latino, only 44% of Latinos will ask about confusion to a healthcare professional. So we have 56% of people out there that they should be asking, but they don't want to. You might be asking why. And this is something that I heard and really is very painful. Might be afraid of asking the doctor something. I have heard this. If this were important, they will ask me about it. I usually need to ask my patients, how are you doing? They say, fine. Okay, but let's talk about it. Have you had any headache? Have you had this? Have you had that? It takes time. And that patients feel when we are rushing. And many of them have said something around the lines like, I don't want to be a bother. The doctor is running late next time. Or worst case scenario, when I ask things, my doctor looks annoyed. There's no point. In other cases, people think that just forgetting stuff is normal. I'm just getting old. That's what they say. Others are afraid of a diagnosis. I would rather not know. 
And they might tell their, even the doctor, doctor, if this is Alzheimer's, don't tell me. They don't know who to ask. They start making excuses. I'm just feeling stressed. I just haven't sleep well. I'm fine. Um, all, all of this is together. Oh, that many people do not feel that it's a safe place, a place to ask. And this is a, something that I have heard in my research. Most people think and want to talk to a doctor about this thing. But then they might try a few things first. They might start taking more notes, getting setting wrong reminders in the phone, uh, call, calling somebody to make sure that they, they, that they they're always on time. And this is something that when I ask somebody, what would you recommend to somebody that forgot an appointment? And they say, if you see that happens once, twice, or many times, you need to monitor, to monitor, check if things are okay. If you see and you talk to the person and still she doesn't remember things, maybe she needs to go to the doctor to make sure, uh, see what is best, uh, what's the best way to improve or to maintain a certain level of lucid. They, and most Latinos think that the doctor is a very important person, part of your team, but not everybody feels um, that they have the right doctor. And that's even worse because we consider the low number of Latino or Hispanic physicians that are available. Just to give you an idea, we said about 19% of the population of the United States is Latino or Hispanic. Even though the 17% of the health aides in hospitals, nursing homes, and rehab centers uh, or other healthcare facilities are Hispanic or Latino, that numbers go down to 6% of physicians, 8% of the nurses. And why is this important? When somebody looks like you, when your doctor looks like you, you're more likely to receive preventive care. And also you're more likely to accept it. You're more, you feel more confident that the doctor is telling me something that is good for me. Is uh, I feel confident to bring up new complaints, uh, complaints. And this is common after I, I have seen a patient before I go, anything else you would like to tell me or anything else that should we talk about today? There's always something else. Um, and is that, that environment when they feel safe to bring those up? And even more important, they are more likely to continue care. In dementia and Alzheimer's disease, we sometimes need to wait months, see how things progress, do a few tests and let's wait and see. Let's see medication works. Let's see if, if can we resolve other things. This requires a long-term relationship. When a doctor looks like you, is somebody that you trust, you're more likely to do those things. But now let's assume that all of that was good. We still have issues with understanding the diagnosis. And I very commonly hear things like, oh, um, your family member has dementia. Oh, thank God it's not Alzheimer's. Uh, there's a perception sometimes that many of the information that we have available is too complicated. A lot of information in order to be able to help our communities need to be one third grade really level, bilingual. Why? Because even though an older adult might not read in English, their son, the daughter, granddaughter, the persons that help them and takes them to the appointments will be more likely to be fluent in English. And they might prefer reading in English than reading in Spanish. And we also need to use a lot of pictures and videos because again, a picture is worth a thousand words. And these barriers and these things go even beyond diagnosis. Caregivers, and I said this before, Latinos are more likely to have unpaid caregivers. And I start by saying, and this is not from my research, but this is something that I have heard many times from many researchers in, and many community members. Caregiver is not a word that we use. We are in charge of, we are just taking care of grandma. We are in charge of their appointments, but we don't use the caregiver to define ourselves. Most of those people that are care taking care of somebody are female. And most of the times caregiving is, is a multi-generational event. 
there's kids at home. So we are talking about the most common caregiver, and this comes from research from the um, US, uh, us against Alzheimer's, is going to be a 42-year-old female Latino that works, on, uh, that works maybe part-time or is a stay-at-home mom. And she's taking care for at least one or two kids. So she might be preparing dinner and she says to her son or daughter, hey, keep an eye on grandma. And this is where we say unpaid caregivers. They are there and they're doing the best they can. But think about how many women cannot go and work outside of home because they need to be there for the family member. And many of them have said that they don't know that there are resources or they cannot afford the resources. Having a adult daycare, respite services, they're very expensive. Then, um, and these are usually not covered by insurances or they might be covered, but to a limited degree. And in many occasions, resources are not in the language. And I have heard, oh, we have a great a daycare here. Say, so, do you have somebody that speaks Spanish? Because, <laughs> you know, you need to communicate with my mom to make sure that she's fine, that she needs, if she's thirsty, if she's hungry. Oh, no, we don't have anybody that speaks Spanish. So the resources might be there, but they might not be available, really, for us, for accessible to us. And finally, we take care of our own. And this is something one of uh, my community members said to me, this is shameful and sad when someone is sick and they take it to a nursing home. They are all alone. It is very sad. There's a certain expectation that we are taking care of family members at home. Um, and this is part of our culture, but it's an asset. We have a very close family unit. So it's something that is going to be helpful for us in the future. We just need to make sure that everybody has the tools that they need to do the work that they need to do. So all of the things I have told you are just the tip of the iceberg. What can we do? Well, we know that trusted sources, sources can increase awareness. During the COVID pandemic, we went from in-person events to social media. And there's multiple different campaigns and events and everybody has now a social media presence. And social media can be powerful. In one of the projects that I'm working on that we received funding from the Wisconsin Partnership Program, we have been exploring more. What are those messages that help us to increase the awareness and help and engage with Latinos, uh, Hispanic or uh, uh, adults in, that live in Madison? So we shared this graph from CDC and we got a few likes. It's in Spanish, but most people don't, didn't pay attention. When we created our own materials and using bright colors and still in Spanish and even sometimes in English, we increase our engagement. More people share when they felt a personal connection to the message. And to give you an example, uh, part of this work, we partnered with the, the Latino Health Council, Consejo Latino para la Salud in Madison, Wisconsin. So they've been working and developing a lot of materials throughout the pandemic. And we've been working with them on see how, what are the things that work for Latinos. So I'll give you an example. First, this was January of this year. We shared a vaccine, information about the vaccine, a link to EW Health. We reached about 77 people with that post. Now, okay, what happens? We have a nice picture of a kid. Oh, it looks so cute. Still, seven, eh, 78 people. We didn't increase a lot. What happens now if we share information from a trusted professional? And this is a post by Dr. Armando de Alba. He's a physician in Nebraska. And we have shared information several times. He was getting the, the vaccine. Um, that was in January. And we reached about twice as many people, 140. Here we started thinking, okay, maybe what we need is a superstar. We need somebody that's on TV. We shared this message by Dr. Juan Rivera. He is in Univision, he's one physician, he has shared many, a lot of posts and information and he's sort of a trusted source. We shared a video of him after he got his COVID shot, um, 166, yeah, 163 people saw it. Okay, I think we were thinking, okay, this is it. Uh, this is the amount of people that we reach. But then we shared this post 
one of our community members, the, uh, one of our pillars of our community getting her shot, we reach out to 2,000 people. When you see yourself, when you see the people that you know in social media and getting the shot, you're more likely to engage. And this is very important because we know it's not only the language, it's also who is the messenger. And it's also a representation in media. And um, there's very few opportunities for Latinos to see themselves talking about Alzheimer's. We have done some advertisements with La Movida, but also you can, uh, there's very few <laughs> representation. And this is part of the things that we're working on. How do we get the word out? But part of getting the word out as also means preparing the healthcare for workforce. And remember what I said that only 6% of physicians are Latino. I'm there. Only 3% of physicians are Latinas, female physicians. We are only 2% of medical school faculty and 3% of the medical school matriculants. That's a very low number. And in order to make sure that we have the generation, the replacement generation, those that are going to be taking care of us, and me, myself, I have to say, like, I want somebody that understand my culture and understand me when I get old and I need care. Part of that is the Latinas in Medistel Twitter community. And this is part of the using social media for connection. This work started with uh, Dr. Narhus Duma and also Brianna Christopher, where we uh, started to create this community to share, to amplify, to connect with other Latinas across the country. When we are only 3% of all physicians, across the country is very important that we support each other. And this is something that many of our Latinas have shared. Our network proudly celebrates our heritage, rejoices in each other's triumphs, and provides unconditional support when facing challenges. And there's a lot to learn. There's way, way more to learn that we can actually cover today. But Wisconsin is a great place to be. There's a lot of information at the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Research Center. You can go to their website and find a lot of information about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, clinical trials. There's also um, the dementia care specialists around the Wisconsin. Um, these are supported by the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. And many of the aging and disability research centers, they have information about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and resources available for everybody. And there's also the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute that we have a lot of information. And we, tr and, and we have a network of clinics around the state. So you can look for a memory clinic, a place where to get a diagnosis, where to get specialized care. You just go to the website of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute, check the clinic network, and you can even look at the list by country of what are the clinics around the state where this, and these belong to multiple health systems. And I want to highlight that. There are some independent, there are multiple health systems. So it doesn't matter the insurance that you have, probably there's a clinic that can see you. And these clinics um, are all around the state. You can also download this file that contains the phone number, the address, the physician that's in, that, that's in that location. So you can start looking for answers. And there's also many resources. And I want to highlight this My Brain Guide. Um, the information in English and Spanish, they have been working, um, they, they launched this platform uh, earlier this year, and there's many, a lot of information for you, for your, for family members, and I really like the questionnaire. So sometimes we don't know if something is normal or no, we don't know if we need to ask for help. You can do a questionnaire either online or calling over the phone and answer some questions either about you or a family member or a loved one and see, do I need help? Or where do I start? And they personalize, tailor the resources. So you can start reading and see, is this an issue? Is this something that I should be taking care of? It's not a diagnosis, and I want to be clear of that. But it's a point to start looking for information tailored to where you are right now. And I know this relates to a question that we had in YouTube. Um, does wine really uh, help with Alzheimer's? For Alzheimer's, we know that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So things like exercising, walking, a healthy diet, taking care of your 
high blood pressure, high blood sugar, all of those things help our brain. Alcohol and wine, we haven't shown that. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to take care of your heart first. So this is part of the things that I hope there's a lot of information out there. And I hope that's as if you get something out of all of this talk is this. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. And I have to say, I'm very, very grateful to be here today, but also for the support of many organizations. I received funding from the uh, Health Resources and Service Administration. They have found um, the research fellowship that I'm doing. I have received funding from the Department of Medicine for my research. I have received funding from the Wisconsin Partnership Program, also from ICTER. And I recently was selected as a scholar of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Dis Research Center. And how does this look like? Uh, these are all the logos of all of my partners and people that have supported me in my career. And I wanna say thank you to all that I couldn't put all the names here because I don't have enough space, but thank you for being here and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Um, Raj asked, you mentioned by 2060, Alzheimer's will reach a critical level. Do you think emphasis on bilingual education, especially English, Spanish from K-12, including on STEM subjects will help alleviate the problem you have mentioned? He notes, nice presentation and educational. So what, what's your uh, take on K-12 bilingual STEM education? I think it's certainly one step in the right direction and um, because it's going to help us not only to have the workforce available, but also to have more people be um, part of research and be, be more understanding of what are those differences when you have one language versus two languages. How much of an impact will that make on our issues in the future is what I don't know, but certainly I hope is a is just for the better and we can, um, it can help to alleviate all of those problems. And I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Uh, let's see, well, the chat bumps there. Sandy um, asked, are you working with Kim Mueller? She gave a talk um, on connected speech and early mild cognitive impairment. Yeah, Dr. Miller is part of the, also is part of the, my department, and I'm not working with her directly, but she's doing amazing work. I'd like to ask, um, you made a point that was new to me, and that was just the name for the calf of your leg, and I, you know, asking somebody how their yams are doing, or sweet potatoes, you had six, seven different words for that, um, how, how do people go about this when you have such a diversity of um, Spanish and yet people can come from all over the Western hemisphere to our hospitals? We need to be able to talk with them. How do, what's the approach for something? I think you did a great job of opening my eyes on that, but what's the approach? That's a very good question. I think usually the approach um, is the ideal is I keep asking questions. So which is sometimes hard when we are limited of time. The first thing that we do is like, could you tell me more? Or when we are referring to a part of the body, could you show me? But is that uh, increasing the diversity of healthcare professionals? So when we have different people from different countries or different backgrounds, we can have a little bit more of understanding. That's part of also the, Sometimes it's very hard and that might not be a good way to translate or understand, but it's about taking the time to ask, what do you mean? And keep going and asking questions and trying. And this takes time. And one of the things uh, we recent, there was recently a book published on medical Spanish and I wrote a chapter on it. And it's part of that, that it's, an, it's not easy. It's not easy and it's part of that, why we need to as a healthcare professional to so take our time for that interview. And if we are using interpreters, making sure that we work with the interpreters as much as we can. They are there also to help us to understand these things. And it's part of asking, keep asking questions. Are there other questions that people would like to ask either in the chat or you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you'd like and ask a question. 
Uh, there was something in the chat I mentioned about it. Do bilinguals think differently in each language? That's one of the things that we don't know, but also that I, in my research, we need to be careful. If you ask me something in Spanish, I might answer a little differently than if I answer in English. And it's part that if we ask for symptoms, like how frequently do you have this? Or how will you feel sad? The word sad is different in my mind from English and Spanish. So that's part of, again, asking questions, trying to understand what we mean, and do not assume. Do not assume that everybody interprets the same word in the same way. I'd like to ask um, about how these issues carry over to allied fields such as, uh, especially pharmacy, where you have to have very technical conversations over drugs um, and symptoms and side effects. What are your colleagues in pharmacy doing um, comparable to or different from what you're doing? Yeah, as far as I know, they're doing the same, um, but that's one of the things that is hard and we know that in certain pharmacies, when they serve large Hispanic populations, they might have better tools, like they're having the instructions in Spanish, or they might have additional pictures and things to explain things. That's one of the reasons why in many locations, not only we rely on healthcare professionals, but for example, we have promotoras or community health workers somebody that could also check with patients and individuals, how, how is your medication working? And be help, uh, help with that connection and making sure that even after somebody leaves the pharmacy, they have a resource or somebody they could help. Um, but it's one of the things that we still haven't figured out, I don't think, in, across medicine, but we are working on it. And if anybody has ideas or uh, have seen a good project going around, let me know, because I always looking forward for to see what other people is doing. That's great. Other questions, comments? I, I put a question in the, in the chat about the built environment and about the SNAP program and looking at SNAP uh, for carrots and sticks and all the terrible food we eat and our built environment that uh, doesn't force us to exercise. I'm seeing the links, give me one second. And um, Sandy, can you frame that as a more direct question? I think that'll help me and uh, it'll probably help Maria too. Well, I, just, I referenced a New York Times article about uh, the SNAP program and um, looking at that with carrots and sticks, whether it does any good. There, we're gonna be increasing uh, food uh, av availability for people that that need food assistance and uh, when you when you need uh, the calories uh, sometimes you, you get bad calories uh, at the cost of uh, future alzheimer's and dementia by eating you know, poorly uh, poor nutritional foods i think i understand a little bit i cannot speak specifically about the snap program that's something that i cannot speak specifically or how that will affect but certainly what I can say is that food is more than just also availability. Um, it, being eligible for SNAP doesn't mean that many Latino families will access it. Even though it's, very, it's a minority of the Latinos that are undocumented, 75% of, of, uh, uh, of Latinos will not take um, will not be part of certain programs of a safe assistant because they are afraid that their participation will affect a colleague, a neighbor, a family member. So just because it's, I cannot speak of how SNAP will affect, but just because SNAP is there doesn't mean that it's being used. And certainly part of the diets and how do we make sure that we increase um, the, in the build environment, we make sure that it's, uh, the best resource and the best option for us and for our health, that affects everybody, regardless of race and ethnicity. And there's still a lot of things that we don't know. And I have to thank my colleague, um, Dr. Lecaire, that just sent me a text uh, that to remind me that we are still figuring it out, the exact. There's a US pointer study that is a very large clinical trial 
where they are trying to see really what are the effects of diet and exercise on the long-term Alzheimer's disease. We know it helps, but we don't know is how much or how much can we prevent Alzheimer's by having a healthy diet and doing exercise. And that's one of the clinical trials that's going on right now. And thank you, Tammy, for that reminder. Excellent. Um, you pointed out that the percentage of, I believe it was Hispanic um, population in Wisconsin is around 9%. There are colleges or universities that the U.S. government designates as Hispanic serving uh, institutions. Are there any such institutions in Wisconsin? And if not, what, what, what might we do to help speed that on their way? Um, the great question. As far as I know, there are no Hispanic serving institutions in Wisconsin. As far as I know, I also haven't looked too deep into it. But re even if we are not part of making sure um, for our students across the Wisconsin is making sure that they feel welcome. And one of the, that's part also what Latinas in Medicine does. When we are the only one in the room that looks like us, there are comments like, you might think they are well-intended, but like, oh, your English is so nice. Remember what I told you, 65% of Latinos were born here. So when you say things like, oh, your English is so nice, they might feel that you are, you are, you are saying that you are not from here. So this is one little thing that could help us serve all of our students and our Latino students across Wisconsin. Accepting that their differences and making sure that the environment we have for them is welcoming and they feel safe. They don't feel that they're being treated as other. Very good. I just uh, Googled it and I see there, are, as of spring last year, there were two designated as Hispanic serving based on having 25% or more um, Hispanic undergrad. Uh, what are they? I'm curious now. Yeah. So this will be interesting to see what the UW system and UW-Madison in particular, how our uh, populations undergraduate, graduate, and professional, how those trend over the coming years. Uh, does anyone have any other questions that they'd like to ask? And all right. And I want to share. Tell me about that. Uh, I'm going to give you an easy one. Tell us about that plant behind you against, against the door. Oh. That is an ave del paraíso, so birds of the paradise. And it was very common in Venezuela. I, during med school, I used sometimes to drive from one town to another and there were thousands of them in every, in every corner. So it reminds me of home. Of course, that one is fake, but it looks very nice. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I'm a plant pathologist and I was gonna come over and help you know identify the, uh, the fake diseases on it. So that's great. Uh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Are there any final questions? Looks like there's one new one there. Let's see. Sandy saying great science storytelling. I all can chime in with that. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot tonight um, and I'm grateful. Um, next week,